What's up, everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakyan. Very pumped to be talking about social science and AI. We have Sonia Schmergalunder joining us on the show. Hi, Sonia. Hi, Alan. Thanks for coming on the program. Thank you. I'm so excited for this. <laughs> it took a long time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. A year ago, you were teaching me a lot about your work, and I was so pumped. And it took a little bit of going back and forth. You were actually the catalyst that got us to the American Anthropological Association as well. Yeah. With your focus on studying humans and behavior. And then the last two years now, we've been doing partnership interviews with them at the annual meeting, and they've been blowing our minds. That's awesome. You have been there more often than I, even though I'm an anthropologist. <laughs> For those that don't know Sonia's background, she is a senior research scientist at Smart Information Flow Technology, SIFT, where she is a PI on Myriad projects at the intersection of high-risk tech innovation and psychological well-being, winning government research grants from NASA, DARPA, and the Department of Defense. And you can find the links in the bio below to her SIFT.net profile page, also HighSeas.org, and also her LinkedIn and Twitter pages. Okay, so Sonia, let's start by talking about kind of the main uh, research areas, and we'll break these down as we go. Um, the first one is team dynamics and social sensing of human and human cyber teams under high stress. Mm -hmm. Yes. So again, this is like very macro level perspective. Walk us through this field of study and mm -hmm. the projects within it. Sure. Um, so keep in mind that I'm a social anthropologist, as you have noted in the beginning here. Um, not necessarily a psychologist or a team researcher. I'm also not a computer scientist, but I have been working with a tech company now for 10 years, and I'm trying to merge social science knowledge with, you know, next waves of development within the AI framework very broadly. So very often what I do, or what we do as a team is um, trying to see where the social sciences can actually inform uh, new technology development. So all of these projects have ultimately the goal in order to be applied uh, and or the goal to have a tool that can be developed, a tool that can be used, an AI that can be used and implemented. So what I do very often is like in early stages, come up with some crazy ideas as to what we should be looking at or what we could be looking at in, in order to inform the development of the technology. Um, but then also s like see it through and then test it out in like ex like high risk experimentation such as high seas for example to get data in order to better understand like you know how how we work as a team for example but how we work as an individual as well because as again as an anthropologist like I'm largely driven by um, personally driven by understanding what I don't understand um, yes. and uh, I quite enjoy that. So um, the Matula project, for example, is one such uh, research project uh, that I like to, um, when somebody asks me, ask me about this, I, I like to say like I, <laughs> I perform like PSYOPs operation in a secret research facility in Hawaii. <laughs> and it, it's not even wrong, yeah. uh, <laughs> even though my funding agents probably don't want to hear that. Um, no, but I do is like I work as a PI on um, so-called space simulation studies. We are yeah. trying to simulate the conditions of space flight or you know, either to Mars or to Luna, for example, yeah. or to, to the moon, lunar surface operations, and then um, have like the stress or be the environment and the confined uh, in you know physical environment the social isolation have that actually be the stressor and understand like how people are interacting now that creates in itself already a lot of stress and it gives us as researchers the opportunity to actually also have control over the things that we otherwise might not have control over in an environment uh, so it makes it what we like to call ecologically a bit more valid mm. when we have subjects come into a lab there's a lot of things that can go on outside your life that might impact the results that we see in a lab experiment, for example. Um, it's also not very, you know, it, um, 
I mean, of course, like basic research is very important, but like it's very different from you know looking at the desktop at specific images and then like record like you know a physiological sim signal based on like an angry face that you have seen. It's not that this <laughs> research is not important; it's very fundamental as oh, yeah. well in order for us to make you know assessments about the human mind, if you want. But a um, full-scale space simulation where yeah. you simulate literally the. Uh, restrictive environment and social uh, setting where mm -hmm. I'm only going to be around five other people for months, if not yeah, yeah years at, at a time. And um, the, the, the individual psychometric profiles of all of these people have mm -hmm. to dance, uh, yeah. Yeah, harmonize. Yeah, I, this is a good uh analogy like music for example or dance right like the ensemble that plays together stays together mm -hmm. uh, there's rhythmicity mm -hmm. that i believe we can pick up and we pick it up in language when we look at like linguistic synchronicity for example we look at, at the physiological signals desynchronize we look at microbiome signals as well wow. even the microbiome yeah. synchronizes that that might just simply be because everybody's eating the same diet yeah. but yeah. there's also even studies that have shown that the ear um, picks up signals that uh, can be informative of social states pheromones for example is, a, is is one such things and i'm not the expert in that field but i've seen like interesting studies where uh, that has that have happened in movie theaters where people are ex watching a movie and experience like a variety of emotional states and you know people with that know something about toxicity in the air mm -hmm. are able to pick up the signal in the air as to what the audience was feeling in particular like things like suspense or happiness and that was perfectly synced. So and spiritual people sometimes call this the collective consciousness. Yeah, yeah. There, there's a lot of interest in collective um, um, consciousness or collective experiences yes. all together, right? And the, the, it's all a matter of scale, right? Yeah, like yeah. if you if you have like a team of six people in an enclosed environment, that's <laughs> a collective already. Yeah, if yeah. you have like a cultural group, that's yes. also a collective. Yes. Um, so. I scales, think yes. it, it is a matter of scale, but I think there's clearly, you know, something very beautiful about this experience and it can be very beautiful um, or, or it can be very stressful. A family is another unit, right? Oh, yeah. like, so social wow. where, where yeah. you live in close social relationships, where you live with people that have an impact on you or that you care about. Um, Darby Saxby at UCSD um, has said that like social relationships are our um, greatest stressor, but social relationships are also our greatest like release from that stress. And I think that is exactly wow. one of the yeah. things uh, <laughs> that we are trying to understand when we look yeah. at collective allostatic load. Yes, yes. This is a very important subject, the allostatic load, allostasis. Um, teach us about what that is. Um, and teach us about um, methods, which we've talked about on the program so much, um, methods to do um, behavior changes that return us faster to healthier, happier states of being, more pleasant mm -hmm. states of being, instead of excessively ruminating on anger yeah. or stresses. And yeah. the importance of that, especially in these enclosed collective environments, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I don't know how uh, I can teach people to, you know, become happier. That's not the business I'm in. I'm still trying to figure it out for myself. <laughs> that said, I, I don't even mind if people have social conflicts <laughs> because then I can study that. You study them. <laughs> And I'm not afraid of that either. Yeah. Um, but this is so crucial because how mm -hmm. do you create a uh, the the proper people going to um, these um, lunar surface missions or Mars missions, these space missions that uh, have the greatest efficacy for success. Mm -hmm. um, and how do we make the not only the biometric psychometrics for that, but also the um, build out the environment, um, the, the different things that they can play um, mm -hmm. with, where mm -hmm. I think you were teaching me about a year ago that there's literally like 
simulations of like beaches and you know vr oh, yeah. of yeah. experiences in that so that yeah 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 yeah, yeah. I said this that was one of the studies that we have been carried carrying out previously where we have looked vr uh, we've used vr we are still using vr uh then as a tool in order to combat the feeling of isolation which is perfectly suited if you live in a very enclosed environment then you have the opportunity to you know escape um if you know, the people that you live with start to annoy you, you just basically, literally, you know, don't just close your eyes and go off into La La Land, but actually yeah. go into a, a virtual a reality world, space yeah. and, um, you know, feel like there's, uh, you know, there's something else going on or you can distract yourself from like maybe things that are going on. Um, let me back up to um, what mm -hmm. you were asking yeah. about um, these teams. So, uh, in the past, uh, very often, you know, clearly I mean, space flight and VR, all these, all these things that they look, you know, they sound cool and it's all ca cutting edge, of course. But um, we are very often focused on, you know, the skill set that these people have, that they are phys physically fit, and these are very, very important things, of course, because yeah. if we think about space flight. We cannot, um, you know, we, we have to consider these factors that they are mentally stable and that they are physically stable. But yeah. what we have, what we have neglected very often in this kind of research is the social variable. Um, how well somebody is able to deal, for example, with social conflict has been like, you know, we've learned the hard way that that actually can make or break yeah. uh, a mission. And these experiences that we have, and we all have had, like when working in a team, like we said before, for example, if you work in a musical example, or if you play like Dungeons, Dra Dungeons and Dragons with somebody else mm. online, you can have a great experience with a small team, or you can have like a not so great experience. Yeah. This is utterly important when you like send like people. Like when you play the game of <laughs> Monopoly and then the person that's like losing flips the board game over versus <laughs> ones that can uh, harmonize better with e the process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, yeah. It's just very uh, simple. Or like when you have a deeper experience of someone's like emotional state where mm -hmm. um, do you maybe get triggered by um, somebody else's um, a move or mistake in some way in these small enclosed environments mm -hmm. or do you know how to stay emotionally resilient meditative equanimous help them also grow and ascend um, mm -hmm. rather than take them down into these stressful mm -hmm. situations yeah 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 um, all, all very good points of course I mean there's uh, we're, we're trying to figure out how like the team can help each other because you know there's of course like stringent screening criteria we're trying to get the best of the best people not, not just for the simulation studies but um, especially when you know we're thinking about like real space exploration and not just like individuals living together in a habitat in Hawaii, for example. Yeah. So, of course, we look at resiliency, but the thing is that um, we we have very little data or very little knowledge as to what is actually happening happening to a person over time, over long periods of time. Right. I mean, I can be resilient, uh, or you know, at least try to. You know, have you know, do the best I can on the short periods of time when we go to work, for example, and you have like a bad work environment and have a team that doesn't work well, you get to go home and you know decompress. But if you are continuously exposed to a stressful environment, such as in like isolation in a confined environment, you don't these kind of like mechanisms very often break down because you don't have the ability to withdraw and maybe recharge and that is what yeah. the allostatic load really is like it's a chronic stress that is um that you are exposed to and over long periods of time uh this this is going to change how you react and people very often themselves don't even know how, how they might react like in you know when when they are like uh, locked up for 12 months um, for example which we also have had in the past now we, the next set of studies is going to be a bit shorter which is going to do one month long studies um, because we have a, you know, a different like research agenda here but ultimately if we think about um, Mars uh, mission we are talking about two and a half years and so far, we have very little data about um, what that does to the team, what it does to an individual living together for two and a half years, because, you know, we haven't done that very often in high seas, not at all. So the longest was actually one year. Was one year longest. Mm -hmm. And this is also really 
um, mind blowing because you do things like you have simulated the environment to such great depths of, of nuance that there's even those uh, those the, the initial you know you, you literally they're wearing when they go out they have to wear the equipment that they would be when they were on the surface. So they're wearing the l large amounts of equipment. They have to go through the mm -hmm. airtight uh, mm -hmm. chamber yeah. um, uh, and you know the dirty off and then go mm -hmm. into the, um, the oxygenated uh, chamber. I mean, this is very, mm -hmm. uh, there's this, that type of stuff, but then there's also, um, you know, like you're mentioning today, we do things uh, like walk uh, when I'm in a pre and when I'm in a feel feeling of maybe this stress, this allostatic load is building up. Mm -hmm. We do these things called like blowing off steam, where we go exercise or we mm -hmm. go out into nature. We go on a walk. We just you know kind of like move apart from the other person for a period of time. But when you're in this small habitat and mm -hmm. there's you have to like go out to like mars to like mm -hmm. blow off steam how you know there's so there's that like what are you going to do in those situations are you mm -hmm. going to go into the virtual world how are you mm -hmm. going to work out in a small little chamber mm -hmm. etc mm -hmm. um and how do you also predict the right people in terms of mm -hmm. like we were talking about this last time but just if you're sending six people do you send people do you send six women do you send six mm -hmm. men mm -hmm. do you send three women and three men but how like do you want them to have romantic relationships because then they can procreate on mars um no <laughs> we don't <laughs> <laughs> you're like i know this answer why not we i mean i mean imagine the trip and i mean there's it's just a safety risk i mean you cannot give birth in the spaceship uh there's too many like factors that what about be, uh, birth on mars though well e even worse like right i mean there's no uh infrastructure is, I mean, there's nothing in place i don't see unless we have a colony out correct. there correct yes with, um, sending a couple trips yeah. with robots to assemble the initial yeah. correct yeah infrastructures yeah. and okay. habitats uh yeah. I, I don't i haven't thought that far uh <laughs> so far we are just trying to have people actually live together for a year a trip and back yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and yeah. i mean it's it's a controversial topic uh I, I like to talk about it um some of the funding agencies don't like to talk about like things like sex for example because it's you know not public relations <laughs> safe as but i mean everybody knows about that that um we are also sexual human yeah human beings like with you know certain needs and that need to be addressed so you know it should be sent mixed teams just women just men i mean the the needs the human needs are not going to go away depending on the team composition um some yeah. of the simulation studies have shown that like romance uh can you know improve mood of course that makes sense However, even like all, as all social relationships, romantic relationships also undergo a life cycle and in two and a half years that could have catastrophic outcomes if you go past the honeymoon and then like the conflict that otherwise might have been minor becomes much more mm -hmm. severe, for example. So the general tendency so far is to avoid that um, and have you know, people that are, can compart compartmentalize that for themselves. Uh, and don't engage necessarily in romantic relationships or sexual relationships. I, I'm not the expert in the field. Uh, I know that there's some other researchers that look into that um, a little bit more undercover again, because like it's a little controversial as a topic, but I think it, it needs to be talked about. And, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm the first person who likes to talk about these kind of things, but um, I, I, yeah. I don't have much to say. Besides yeah. that, with regards to team composition, that yes. we don't have a great understanding yet. Uh, the general tendency is to have mixed teams. Uh, and that's not just from knowledge from the mass or, you know, space simulation studies, but organizational and behavioral studies um, that, uh, you know, if you compare it to other data that we have, and there's very little data on just all female teams, for example, because in the past, if you think about space simulation studies, it has been all male teams. Now we have realized that women are maybe socially a bit more intelligent, so the team benefits generally with more social intelligence. Is it an all-female team? Would that be ultimately better? 
so far the verdict is out. I, I don't know. There's a lot of things that would speak for that. Um, um, but there's also a lot of things that would speak against that. You know, there's gender differences when it comes to, um, um, for example, uh, you know, depression or mental, like, um, mental things, <laughs> mm -hmm. I should say. And the de depression, in, in order to answer the other, the other part of your question, um, you know, how, how do you, how can we help this team? There's, um, it, it has been reported and we have experienced that like over long periods of time, there is certainly a high risk of more than one individual, maybe the whole team to start to feel depressed or what we would consider like, you know, low mood or low valence and what we can make assessments of. There have been some some anecdotal evidence for that, uh, which I think is quite beautiful. Comes also from a study where there has there have been like six individuals living together, and one of them started to withdraw more and more. Um, and there's mm. private quarters in some of these like isolation chambers um, where you can withdraw. And this one person like was withdrawing more and more, and like lit severely feeling depressed. Mm. And then the the team members of that crew had to basically intervene and they came together and literally lifted that person yeah. physically yes. out of their quarters and said, come, you are part of us. You, yes. we, we hold you yes, here. Yes. And I think that speaks for the collectiveness of small teams of like us as humans that like we have these capabilities of saying like, you know, you don't feel good. It's understandable you want to be left alone, but the more you are not part of us, the worse you might feel. So here, here we are, like we are mm -hmm. able to carry you, you know, and we, we offload some of this allostatic load that yeah. um, you experience much more than we do. So going back to the research goals with the uh, current project, for example, is exactly that, like this offloading and onloading of stress. Mm. If there is a person that is depressed, that is part of your team, is that person going to ruin it for everybody else? Or is there a mechanism in place uh, where everybody else can like actually, you know, help that person in order yeah. to make sure that everybody is going to be okay? So you're also designing um, interventions to decrease allostatic loads, to return people to allostasis. Well, right now we just want to more or less understand the mechanism. And once we understand it, we can then provide maybe diagnosis. And then once we can provide a diagnosis, then we can intervene. Uh, it's you know, it's not as simple as that, that we say, try, try to do this. Um, so, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. For, for, for me, it's been um, now several years of interviewing different people that have come onto the program that have been teaching methodologies for uh, returning themselves to a state of equanimity or inner peace, um, given this serious just swings in different directions that we experience in life, and to hold that sort of inner state of deep love and peace and interconnectedness um, mm -hmm. presence that is just the most difficult almost part of knowing yourself is is knowing how to get back to that state because mm -hmm. then what happens is whether you're with family friends coworkers, people online doesn't matter your ability to be come back to that moment butterfly effects out to other people mm -hmm. and then it creates that more harmonic um, environment around mm -hmm. you and around the world by doing so so this is actually to know these mechanisms mm -hmm. again thousands of years have went with people studying meditation mm -hmm. and this is and thousands of years also with shamanic experiences with ethnobotanists with plant medicines we do more and more archaeology into this and we understand that modern healthcare is missing this component mm -hmm. and so again it's one of these things that what can we really leverage in biology in these rich uh, cultural experiences that um, can make it so that we can thrive better as we go on to these space expeditions and we have these mm -hmm. enclosed um, environments. Mm -hmm. This is mm -hmm. huge for the topics that we've had um, on the program. Oh, absolutely. And if I take off my science hat, but put on my Sonia hat, like, you know, I personally very much believe that um, 
the intention setting that we do when we meditate or when people pray or engage in some sort of like what we consider spiritual experiences, I think, is, I believe, important. So even if we look at like crew members and, you know, a spaceship, the intention setting is important. What are you, why are you in it and what are you in it for? Is it for, you know, self promotion is it uh, for you know the good of the world if you want I, I mean these are things that might not be that clear for yourself even because it requires a lot of self knowledge in order to you know know things like that i i, I certainly don't know anything <laughs> yeah yeah um, this is um uh, I, I'm really happy that we wandered into this field because as we design um, better and better mechanisms for this, we can insu ensure and architect uh, a more prosperous world. Um, okay, uh, that's a lot on um, high seas. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, people, you guys can find more information about that. It's high, uh, H-I hyphen seas, S-E-A-S no. dot org if you want to find out more information about that project. Okay, we still have a lot more to talk about. So that was um, Medulla. I should maybe yes. just mention that this yes, website is um, still a little outdated because it has the high seas habitat is currently actually owned by the Blue Planet Foundation, which is a collaborator on this project together with actually the Behavioral uh, Science Lab at NASA as well. Um, so we are conducting like a number of studies like next year at the high seas habitat that is not necessarily associated with, with the University of Hawaii anymore. So the okay. website is actually reflective more of what we have done in the past. But as we go forward, it's uh, Blue Planet Foundation and also the Moonbase Alliance, um, which is owned by the Blue Planet Foundation and Moonbase Alliance. Yes. Okay. Cool. Um, which is who actually owns that um, mm -hmm. habitat. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Got it. And with it, okay. like. Hank Rogers, uh, who is a prominent figure that like actually owns the habitat, but he does a lot of work with regards to um, helping us understand like sustainability, not just you know in the context of spaceflight, but also like how can we test out these technologies of you know reusing everything, not leaving any waste behind that is important for spaceflight, but ultimately also for the planet we live on right now. Yeah, actually, when you mentioned Hank to me last time as mm -hmm. well, um, I was hoping that we could do something um, with featuring people like Hank in this mm -hmm. space as well. Um, I look forward to, to... Oh, you should. To, He's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. the, these types of interviews are really crucial, like what we're having right now. They, they're they really important because they synthesize a lot of the most pressing fields, plus the direction that we're going in the future and to know how to best be efficient in that process and reduce the oops moments. Um, Okay, let's do um, another one in the same first point that we were in. Again, this is under team dynamics and social sensing of human and human cyber teams under high stress. So the next one is Vanessa. Mm -hmm. Virtual analysis networks and explanations for social sensing analysis. Mm -hmm. Okay, so walk us through this. Uh, there's not that much to say about the project. It is... Um a smaller project actually and it's very related to what i've been talking about before it's also related to a new effort called assist so the goal here is really try to understand not just human teams but human human cyber teams uh, meaning that if we have a cyber agent or an ai as part of the team like how does it change the team dynamics what do, would that function be um, so some of the research efforts are often going towards um, getting a better understanding of that where an AI agent would be more or less an assistant or a helper for a team and where we could like offload all the tasks to a cyber agent or an AI yep. that uh, the team itself is not good at, yes. such as gathering a lot of information identifying patterns, making inf inferences about team dynamics themselves, and then provide recommendations, what you were hinting yes. at before with regards to what kind of like, you know, strategies should we provide. That is more uh, part of that project is like to do, um, and I should maybe just talk briefly about some of these sensors that we're looking at. Yes, if, um, let's do it. Yeah. Done, um, 
and you know this has all been born out of like really NLP natural language processing methods originally where we had like teams or individuals write journal entries and then we analyzed like the the language that they used yeah. in order to make assessments about how they feel that then has like grown into um more behavioral research where we also look not just at what is said or the written um but also what kind of behaviors people are displaying and now we are integrating um um, also physiological components such as stress measures or as mentioned before even like the microbiome so we are trying to combine physiological cognitive and um, uh, behavioral components in a ultimately in an algorithm that then can monitor teams that then can help inform you know an AI if you want about how the team is feeling with in our case with a big focus on the social components and not just the health uh, you know the physio physiological components but on the social components of the team and then like provide uh, recommendations or intervene before it you know it goes down yeah. <laughs> uh, that that is the ultimate goal and that's that's what we are using these studies and these metrics from so Vanessa is really more um, the development of the AI using some of the data and so is actually assessed and like this mm -hmm. is a new program where um, on the one hand like we are trying to build a model of like collective allostatic load with assist we are trying to build a model of like what is generally considered theory of mind um, and in our or in, I should say in SIFT's um, viewpoint it's uh, a plan recognition problem and plan recognition and is uh, a concept coming out of computer sciences and like uh, give your mind that everybody at the company that I work at is a computer scientist so I'm the only social scientist there um, which is for me if I translate it to you know my social science world uh, is a is a problem of um, knowledge sharing so my worldview, if you want, is informed by the knowledge that I have. And your worldview is informed by your knowledge that you have. And I have my perspective and you have your perspective. And we are trying to understand each other. Yes. We're doing a pretty good job in that right yes, now. Yes. But I don't, know, or I don't know you well enough in order to really understand what's going on in your head. Nor can yeah. I make an assessment about what you're going to ask me next. Yeah. Who knows what you're yeah. going to ask me next. <laughs> If you had to throw a number out, it's probably, <laughs> I know, like 0.01% about your worldview, you know, something yeah. like that. Well, then that makes it so hard to have yeah. these things. And it also makes it hard to have that stream of, of uh, biometrics, psychometrics being analyzed by an AI to make recommendations about what yeah. to best do to decrease allostatic loads or to increase efficiencies towards goals. Yeah, yeah. and you're pointing at the, in at the very important problem that we have in that space, and that is the quantification problem right like it's relatively easy for us to measure a heartbeat like you if you're off this uh, over there. yeah 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 <laughs> Ellen, we really Ellen listens to his own heartbeat, we, guys. <laughs> i've made so many posts about that we have a stethoscope here on on, oh, wait, si yeah. on, on site that we uh, yeah. listen to heartbeats at night or each other's <laughs> heartbeats and it's actually a really important exercise hopefully more yeah. people around the world will tune in oh you can also listen to your gut and you'll uh hear yeah. some very interesting things i would be really scared actually <laughs> who knows what's going on in there. <laughs> yes, yes. well Please. so there's the quantification problem of like there's certain things that, that are easier to quantify now if you think of a heartbeat um heart rate variability but then like you merge into language and then it starts to become a bit more difficult to quantify right like i mean we can say like okay positive negative if we talk about valence but if we start to try to understand intentions uh you know we can we're trying actually to do that in language as well it becomes much more difficult now if we remove language altogether and I have to make an assessment about like what you are thinking about just based on what I see and maybe your body language or you know your head nod or your, the size of the pupils of your eye and we are actually very good at that as humans because we have evolved to pay attention Thank to these that. things yeah, yeah. but how we don't know enough about what we are actually paying attention to so it's very hard to inform or provide the quantification of these cues to an AI but that's the intention of like this one program in particular 
uh, is try to use a lot of sensor data in a Minecraft play, actually in mm. a scenario, mm. uh, in order to build and test various theories and models um, that are related to what are considered so-called emergent states where, you know, like situational awareness uh, or like your merges of mental models, um, your mental model or my mental model. And then bringing it back again to my own field within anthropology, um, I think this is very important because here we are talking again of different scales, right? Like you and I versus, you know, China and the yeah, US, so. for example. These are also, mm, you know, different perceptions that we are trying to make assessments about on a very large scale with very large variabil variabilities within. But that's a different set of, you know, collective consciousness, if you want, that is hard to quantify, right? Because traditionally within anthropology, we haven't been quantifying anything. <laughs> it's all qualitative, <laughs> um, you know, and great, um, great records. And I shouldn't like... You know, I want to point out, I believe that it is more important than ever to have this qualitative um, angle at that because, you know, there's a whole area of issues if we, quiet, if we, quiet, if we try to um, um, reduce complex knowledge. And, and this is something we, we do a lot when, when oh, yeah. building a uh, SU. Yeah. You know. yeah, yeah. Yeah, now I'm, I'm drifting off. That's a great. Bit. That's <laughs> yeah. a, that, like you said, pointing mm -hmm. at that specific, putting the flashlight mm -hmm. on, um, trying to reduce mm -hmm. complex knowledge into some sort of a recommendation to mm -hmm. augment experiences. Mm -hmm. Good luck. I mean, this is a very, very difficult, um, one of the most important fields that currently has a. <clears throat> uh, a big spotlight on it, structuring unstructured data, making sense of it, and applying it into real life to uh, augment our experiences. Mm. Damn, that one's a huge one. Okay, so that was on um, a Vanessa and on assist. Okay, so let's do the second uh, area. Machine learning bias and the influence of sociocultural context inherent in big data. Mm -hmm. Okay. That is actually a good transition point uh, with regards to what, where we're just merging into the field of anthropology. Um, you know, can, the idea here is that, you know, the bias in the data is a huge problem. Generally, when building AI, we know all about like the, difficulties of like um, training sets reproducing um, you know racism or gender discrimination because uh, the data sets that we have which are used when we talk about AI or building AI or recommendation systems or whatnot um, they are um, full of bias right um, so the idea here is that uh, can we advance anthropological research if you want, if we don't look at the bias as a negative, but as a positive in order to tell us something about the you know, society or culture it actually came from. Yeah. Uh, and I think it's fundamentally the right approach because a lot of efforts, especially by the big tech companies, for example, have focused on trying to remove bias in order to um, really work, I, I, I consider it a little bit makeup in order to, you know, make them look better or in order to improve specific outcomes of, say, a search result, for example, that happened to be racist, but it doesn't um, remove the structural bias inherent in the data because the bias itself comes from a social reality yeah. that we cannot yeah. change <laughs> as, as easily. So why not go and try to understand the uh, cultural context is actually came from and what are, the, what are the variables that contribute to the existence of the bias to begin with. In this case, for example, gender bias, because gender is a um, topic dear to my heart and um, I'm trying to understand. So we looked at gender bias in like large amounts of Twitter data from all over the world, literally 100 different countries. Oh, you went to Twitter for the data <laughs> yeah. for gender bias. <laughs> I can say a lot of things about that. <laughs> so I should, what I should say is it was, this is was it's it ended by now a collaboration with Stanford University and the Computer Science Department cool. of Stanford University and uh, they provided us with that data okay. in order to analyze that. So we had very large amounts of data, and what we um, what we looked at is like uh, more or less 
a lot, uh, many different things, but the idea or ultimate goal is and was with the project is, can we can we find some sort of like causal relationship ultimately, or you know, it's very very hard, and I don't know if we really can, or at least explanations that can help us understand uh, differences in like how gender discrimination is um, quantified in the language that we are analyzing. Could we could we maybe say that like a root or an upstream mm -hmm. variable in uh, gender um, bias and discrimination may be a if in the case of a man uh, maybe their relationship with their mother um, things like that could be some of the most upstream or root issues mm -hmm. if there was like a loving and tight relationship between a son and their mother growing up yeah. that man will likely respect um, women with great yeah. love um that is a very good point, and it's not one that we looked at. <laughs> yes, yes. So these are, I'm always going to upstream or root things, but yes, tell us about what was like that. No, I, th I so you know, in a different project, uh, we looked at incel data, for example, and you know, the incel community. The, yeah, involuntary celibacy. <laughs> yes. Which I uh, uh, really hope um, can uh, uh, find a uh, a. Um, that our society can find love to help um, uh, the, um, the, the um, more healthy uh, states of consciousness and being for people that are labeling um, themselves this way because we can do uh, better. Um, I know we can do better. Yeah, yeah. Because I feel, yeah. I feel a lot and I'm very sensitive to, to things like that. And, um, we can kind of dig ourselves into um, holes by associating ourselves with labels rather than kind of like taking ourselves out into challenging contexts and learning how to grow through hardships. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, yes, I'm please. Glad, yes. I'm glad you feel a lot. <laughs> I feel a lot too, but it's mostly anger. <laughs> <laughs> Especially when it comes to incels. I'm a woman, so I'm biased. Uh, that said, what my point was you talking about, like, you know, mother um, son relationships. Yeah. Uh, I think that is actually something that does play a role in that kind of community. Uh, the data seems to indicate that. Um, that. That much I will say about, you know, things like there's your, of course, your upbringing and if you have been taught to respect women or not plays yeah. a role. I mean, no doubt about that. Yes. Um, but uh, when looking at, you know, on a, on a global level at like gender stereotypes and like how much men versus women uh, associate themselves with particular gender roles, that's a little bit different um, because I believe that gender is a social construct. I believe that there's absolutely a biological reality that, you know, I look different than you and my body looks different than you. But um, the way we behave or the way, uh, you know, what interests us that is very often largely influenced by how we brought up and like how we brought up to fall into these gender stereotypes and that in that sense, looking at the global scale is actually very interesting because we have like direct comparisons between countries where um, the associations of the individual with a specific gender stereotype is maybe a bit more reduced in one country. If you look at like Northern European countries, for example, versus in other countries where women in particular are, uh, you know, don't have the agency to make decisions about who they want to be. Um, who you want to be or who you want to become uh, is a luxury we take for granted in the Western world, but yeah. it's not a given in other countries, right? Yeah, so, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of power dynamics and I'm drifting off like a little bit now from the research itself. Um, when looking at, there's, there's a lot of different social science theories about like, um, like these gender roles and gender stereotypes. And one of the common denominators, at least in the social science literature, is that it is a, a construct, if you want, that like a lot of like how you behave or how I behave and mannerisms that we have are actually just learned features. 
Now, that stands in opposition to um, what is generally known as the gender paradox, um, um, meaning that if, um, if you look on a country level, and this is not research that I have done, but it, some of the research that we have been doing is informed by, but if you look at the country level, um, why you have certain groups of men versus women, like more, you know, why, why is there more female physicians in one country or more male physicians in another country? And what kind of attributes are associated with these professions, for example? Then, then you have to consider the political system and the social structure where this is coming from. Yeah. But then you also have to look at like the, you know, freedom, you talked about like, like degrees free of freedom will for, yeah or, uh, oh, you know how will. yeah like uh, the choice that you have yeah right yeah. so there's this the paradox is uh that in northern european countries where you have generally very high gender equality there's actually very few women that go into stem research occupations or like traditional like um you know, more male, male dominant, dominated occupations where you have like countries in Albania, for example, where you have a high degree of women going into these, you know, predominantly male uh, areas. Interesting, so yeah. we, the researchers have been trying to understand why that is the case. Wouldn't that like be the case that if you have a country like Sweden where women can choose who they want to be, that then they would have, you know, more people yeah. in like male dominated areas. Yeah, yeah. But... Um, I believe it's a U-shaped yeah. function yeah, yeah. where we have countries where um, the women have are maybe exposed to an oppressive system and they're trying to uh, become financially independent or become independent like as, as a person and they will adapt to uh, you know, a system and therefore also make choices that will allow them to break free. Uh, where when you have a system where women are free to choose who they want to be, women actually, it looks like at least fall into like m what we consider more gender stereotypical behaviors. Um, and that is considered the paradox. The point though is if you know, about if you talk about like larger um, collective uh, um, goals, then we want to um, I think it, I believe it is important to provide freedom of choice and not restrict it in any way, like in allow people, yeah. you know, who they want to be. <laughs> yeah, equal degrees of economic freedom to self-actualize. And mm -hmm. um, that's really important. And mm -hmm. um, to be able to uh, look at the stream of stimuli that we deliver to children from the moment that they're born into the world and how our culture around them shapes their decisions, because... Um, many times we talk about um, uh, m men generally being interested in ideas and women generally being interested in aesthetic. And then we also, uh, and social, and women being more interested in social. And then we also simultaneously have shaped our civilization around those beliefs so that then it kind of also makes it difficult to in a sense get us out of those ruts like if women do decide to be interested in stem then sometimes the ruts are so deep that it's hard to, for us to dig our mm -hmm. a way for them to get into that just like with men if they want to get into social work like there's eight out of 10 people in social work being women mm -hmm. um, in, the, in nursing, I, I enter in and there's nine women out of every 10 people that are, that I'm around all automatically. And so again, there's these ruts, like if I really want to serve people in hospitals that way, how do we make it so that it can be easier for people to pursue whatever they want to pursue in terms of um, having these degrees of freedom and try and limit the social pressures that pressure people into specific categories but rather have it be something that's more like finding um out what is really thyself and, and bringing that forth into the world so mm -hmm. that in itself is interesting so with the mm -hmm. twitter data that was being analyzed it was gender biases towards so we, what we did is that we built a model of, we first looked at Twitter data and then we quantified the bias in the data and we saw that there's differences in different countries where there is um, specific concepts that we can measure in language closer associated with, you know, female 
words, if you want, versus like male words, very, very simply put. So we had a way to uh, make, uh, a quant we, we were, had a way to quantify gender bias in the Twitter data so we could like reliably say that, for example, in the area of politics or in the area of like childcare, there is more or less uh, bias in one country versus the other. So that was the first step. And what we then also did is that we basically correlated all this data with statistical indices of countries in order to see if that is actually true, if it actually matched the bias in the data actually match matches like real world recordings of, you know, the World Economics Forum, Gender Gap Index, for example. And we saw that that is in fact the case. Mm -hmm. uh, so that we, in that way, you know, we were able to do a check uh, as well and, and then in that way um, um, make, we made sure that this is, um, um, I, know, I lost my thread now. <laughs> I'm going to have a sip of coffee. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. yes. We'll take a quick moment to do that. Mm -hmm. I also, mm -hmm. as, you know, as you were saying all of that, I also realized that a lot of the things that I've learned in the last couple of years about the field of, 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 of differences between gender and psychometrics, um, I would say are very, yes, of course, interesting to analyze the way that we fit into big five um, personality traits. But also just like the sheer complexity of every single person being very unique in terms of their own individ individualistic expression into the world. Um, also, I just want to respect the fact that evolution is not something that has stopped and that there's a certain way to frame like this moment. Um, and there's constantly a biological and psycho um, social evolution that's occurring all the time around us and that these things are never static um, and so uh, like I don't know something also about just the way that children are funneled into uh, like 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 blue and pink and like mm -hmm. like trucks and stuff like that and dolls and stuff like that just mm -hmm. it all is um, that kind of stuff's very strange to me. Like mm -hmm. it, it's almost, um, it's so binary and non-nuanced that it's actually kind of scary in a sense, like mm -hmm. that you can shape your child's life by the purchase of a toy. Mm -hmm. Um, and like, that's really scary to me because, um, uh, it's, it's almost as though like it'd be maybe more, uh, given the age of the child to be able to enter into the section of toys that they're interested in tools that they're interested in learning from and having them be able to kind of look and try and figure out what interests them the most and then be able to choose themselves mm -hmm. i mean th this, yeah. i know it, it, you know it's Diversity is beautiful, and we don't quite understand that. And diversity, gender diversity is beautiful. And not only that, it's enriching. It's enriching us, and it like provides us with a better and not a worse understanding. And I think this thinking is particularly important as we are moving forward with you know, the development of AI, because what we are we're doing right now is very often we reproduce a social reality that is gender biased, where we think in pink and blue. Yeah. <laughs> um, and we have to in think about, like, you know, the values and the perspectives and the knowledge that I mentioned before when we were talking about teams, when we are building that AI so that we don't, like, suddenly export, if a yeah. company like Google exactly. export, like, an technology into you know a different part of the world where the local knowledge and the local reality haven't been taken into consideration at all that can like you know that is very problematic yep. so yep. i think one of the things um that we have to really think about and that um that we have to think about really deeply is how can we actually integrate the diversity of cultural values when we are building uh ai systems um we are not yeah. doing a great job at that if you look at Twitter training no, data no, in no, particular, no. for example. No. You know, in, in, even in our own research here, we looked at men and women like in Twitter data, so that's a pretty bad example. But, yeah. you know, we have to, of course, start somewhere. But um, having an understanding of like complex, um, yes, yes. In, in, you know, 
it's also like this hype in AI, like, you know, complex systems are very, it's very hard. <laughs> um, Mega corporations have a big uh, responsibility to, um, I think, funnel us towards nuance, towards multivariability, towards love, towards interconnectedness, towards harmony, um, towards uh, uh, gathering in person to explore different states of world views um, rather than um, simply uh, be dominated by the uh, corrupted business plans of the attention economy feeding echo chamber style feeds and advertisements down our throats. Mm. We talk about that quite a bit on, 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 on the program. Yeah, you yeah. have a lot of videos already on the program. It's very hard to have the time to look at all of that. I'm sure <laughs> you know more. <laughs> we love we love talking about that space. Um, mm. That was that was too, okay. Let's get into let's get into the third one. Okay, um, okay text analysis and how language is weaponized to influence mm -hmm. social groups. It's kind of mm -hmm. we just perfect so it, transition to that. Yeah, so. it, exactly. Especially given what you just said about like yes. echo chambers. So, yes. um, I think that's one. It, it's one of the most important um, things to work on right now. Is like the social media space, as you know. Um, you know, I, like, I, I shouldn't quote somebody like Mark Zuckerberg, but he wants to connect people, right, with Facebook. And that's what f Facebook businesses is, is, connecting people at all costs. Um, so there's, you know, are we feeling more connected thanks to Facebook? I, I don't know, right? <laughs> um, the, that said, um, we have here a space where people are communicating and for some of us that provides a sense of like the what used to be you know a village or the coffee at the corner there's a virtual space where communication happens yep. and there's like different influences and uh different behaviors that are suddenly being displayed there's incels that you know have a following and feel um, maybe even stronger than they maybe would otherwise in the real world because there's social punishment um, that doesn't exist in a lot of these social media spaces. So hate speech and cyberbullying and all these like negative things that are happening on the social media space um, have a real world influence and they're not good, right? So how? The goal of this particular research project is how can we like understand what's going on in social media space by looking at the language that is being used in order to understand what the intentions of people are, in particular negative intentions. And this is important because language is very, very powerful and language is intentionally used in order to manipulate and in order to influence others on uh, a large scale. It's really a weapon and has become a weapon and thus therefore it is so important so a lot of money is being poured into this area right now so that we have better tools because um there is an ongoing cyber war between countries that is happening right now and it's a very ugly one and the us is not winning it um so what we have done in particular, it's like a small piece where um, we're looking again at social science theories in order to inform the development of um, tools that we can use in order to, if you want, find the bad guy, but also help people that maybe are have troublesome intentions. Yep. What, how do we do that? There's like a wonderful psychologist called Albert Bandura who used to be at Stanford. He has developed a, a theory around like what we call uh, moral disengagement, meaning that we are actually using or engaging in specific cognitive strategies that we are using. Is everything yeah, okay? Yeah, yeah, good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Keep going. 
Yes. No, I shouldn't look at myself. <laughs> yeah, yeah, keep going. <laughs> yes. Um, so we use particular uh, cognitive strategies in uh, in order to justify, uh, a, you know, harmful actions or atrocities, if you want. Um, this is important because we have to assume, and you will like this, that in general, nobody has, you know, n nobody is, unless you're a psychopath, maybe n nobody like wants to do harm or nobody thinks they're acting immoral. Most people think they act on morally Mor right. Right, yeah, yeah. Even though we might not agree, yeah. but like I believe that, you know, my actions are right for me. But how do I make them right for me? If I actually want to harm you, or if I would want to harm to someone else, what we do then is that we tell a story to ourselves, and that story can be analyzed, and that story contains of things such as dehumanizing language or replacement yeah. of responsibility. We use euphemistic labels. We justify um, our actions by engaging in in these cognitive strategies so that the impact this like instinct this instinctive you know feeling that we have that something is wrong is actually lessened this has happened in you know second world war this is happening in other like areas of the world where like genocide is justified uh right now um so these are things that we can this, this is being like used by politicians if you know they want to justify a war in a different country they are all using this this kind of language that is full of language that will um, make the harmful action less impactful. Yeah, when you um, dehumanize someone, you actually dehumanize yourself. And that's a really hard loop to understand. Um, and it comes from a lot of practice of deep uh, ego loss and ego death um and understanding I of disagree with you here okay. because i don't think that um you d we dehumanize others we dehumanize others because we think we are humans but they are animals they are rats they are cockroaches they come here and take our you know things away that we have built so it makes us human but not them Yes, I, I'm still trying to understand the disagreement because I also have that same perspective that you just listed. I said that when you dehumanize others, you dehumanize yourself, um, meaning that if one gets the idea that... I see what you're saying. Yeah, like yeah. You really, but like you don't actually perceive that to be true. You don't think you're doing that even though you are doing that. What you're saying is like, of course you dehumanize yourself because we are all humans, but the understanding is that like I'm a better human. And yeah, in fact, I'm yeah. so much better. Like, I'm yeah, human. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I'm so much more morally righteous that I can make this dehumanizing mm -hmm. statement about other people when in reality, um, being the one, being the mm -hmm. brothers and sisters that we are trying to collectively pr prosper on, um, on this planet, mm -hmm. that that is uh, a statement that is uh, actually when you do dehumanize someone else, you dehumanize yourself and that um, there, there needs to be a, uh, a stronger cohesion between each other where you can parse um, words that people say on across social platforms and you can predict um, mass violence um, from uh, and prevent it from happening there's there's actually a lot of really interesting work happening in what's called like data fusion with um, fusing uh, psychometric data with um, uh, social data and doing things like predicting violence um, from occurring and preventing it from occurring with uh, mm -hmm. crime prediction, these types of things, which are which are quite interesting um, mm -hmm. fields. Uh, yeah, Palantir's in there. A bunch of other uh, companies are now starting to pop up in that field um, because you can parse uh, people's for negative sentiment, for dehumanizing sentiment, and then um, predict um, mm -hmm. violence. Mm -hmm. um, and also, you can also... <coughs> Uh, you could potentially also try and water people's seeds with love. Mm -hmm. um, because if someone is starting to use dehumanizing language, if there is a way to water their seed um, towards love, it can prevent that violence from happening. And also it can help them grow more down the line where it's not like 
we have to put them in prison, but rather it's mm -hmm. they consciously evolve themselves to not cast malevolence on other people. Mm. That's the preferred solution and the preferred yeah. world. Where is it coming from, right? Like if, is it desperation or is it anger? Um, this, in, you know, this analysis that I mentioned, like trying to understand uh, intentions, sometimes the harm doesn't go towards somebody else. It goes also towards oneself in the case of suicide, for example. So yeah. the place where it's coming from, where love can help might be easier in one case than the other. If somebody, you know, feels like they want to like harm themselves and ultimately maybe jump from the Golden Gate Bridge. Um, love is certainly the right thing, hopefully, you know, <laughs> to provide. Yeah. But if somebody like is full of rage and wants to, you know, shoot um, Muslims in the mall or Mexicans at the border, um, here too, I agree lo that love might be the right tool personally, but it has to reach them. Um, Strategically, and, yeah, tactfully. Yeah, and uh, you know, you, it's very hard to, um, I mean, as psychologists doing a lot of psychological profiling on like mass shooters, for example, um, and very often there's like specific personality traits associated with narcissism, for example, that are very prevalent. So you have to try to go beyond these barriers because, um, you know, I, I, I don't know, um, maybe I don't know enough <laughs> about love in order to uh, understand like how um, love can not just be given but also perceived by somebody who is so troubled in their maybe narcissistic mind that they would go out and like just randomly shoot people. Yeah. Yeah, this is going to be a growing field of uh, taking the <clears throat> this uh, extended phenotype of ours now in the digital sphere and uh, analyzing it and making recommendations for our lives that move us in the direction towards love. Um, yeah, yeah. I love, I'm yeah, I'm with you, Dad. I'm with you, Dad. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's actually right here. We talk about that quite a bit. You know, when when we talk about like the ultimate nature of reality, or when we talk mm -hmm. about things like love, when we talk about things like that on the program. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, it is right here. It's right here when you s when you sit patiently with someone else and you look at them in the eyes and you mm -hmm. you feel the depths of their hearts their spirits are you flirting with me <laughs> this reality you are a married woman with children but that's in general we can flirt with each other in the beauty of love oh, yeah. by just doing simple things like being present with each other in the depths of each other's psyches and just being quiet quieting the mind and just being present with each other mm -hmm. then all different kinds of very profound things occur where maybe you see some of yourself in me i see some of myself in you mm -hmm. that all of a sudden we start merging with our environment with each other we start taking our drop and merging it with this mm -hmm. ocean and then more and more like you start seeing like sonia as a child her parents their parents their parents you see alan's child or their parents 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 and you just start seeing different profound things as long as your lens is trained to see the nature of reality when you uh, immerse yourself in these oh yeah I, I completely agree i think um i'm very sensitive to that as well and i'm actually i'm actually a quite a shy person or maybe just suffer from a lot of social anxiety i don't know which one but i I think it's the most beautiful thing when you really connect with someone. When you truly, really connect with someone, it's so rare. It's also very hard to let go of that because you want to hold on to it because you feel like, you know, there's a, the unison or you, you feel like there's a true understanding. You don't have to explain yourself anymore. 
Um, yeah. So that, uh, and that's that's beautiful. But we just like need to f- use that as our food. You know, like yes. we need to yes. like have that energy and yes, uh, yes. with us, and then like ride with it for you know as long as it lasts. So I think that this it's um, yeah, it's one of the most you know it's one of it's maybe the, the thing that is worth living for. You know, you have yeah. that again with your children as long as you have them of course like there is that's just a very special kind of love yeah um and you have that with people that you meet in your life um along the way very unexpectedly um and that's also a beautiful thing yeah yeah well that answers our last question which is <laughs> what is the most beautiful uh, oh yeah well apart from love i would say i i couldn't do without music i think um th- you know f- for me the, the personally i think the, that music will save the world <laughs> interesting why um it, it, it's a creative act it's like not language it's beyond ourselves i think i i can lose myself in music and go off into you know other planets if you want like right there um and i think there's just some something very deep and moving in music that is so humane if you want that is so connecting uh that you you never feel alone you know you always feel like you're part of something much 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 bigger and when you listen to good music i should say (laughs) and that's subjective so uh that's certainly you know one of the most beautiful things apart from like looking at your children when they wake up (laughs) Yeah. Mm-hmm. <sighs> <sighs> this has oh, been Ellen. so nice. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming on the show, Sonia. Thanks for teaching us about social science and AI. It's been a lot of fun. Awesome. Thank you for having me. There's so much complexity around <laughs> the subjects that you've been telling us about. We yeah, really I think we only it. scratch at the surface. Surface, of yeah. Course, yeah. And then, you know, there's only that much I can say. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and thanks everyone for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below on the episode. Let us know what you're thinking. And at some point, the stream cut, but this has been recorded now, so you will see this. So um, do give us your thoughts in the comments below on the episode about all these topics that Sonia was teaching us about. Uh, talk to your friends, families, coworkers, people online about the subjects as well. Let's have more conversations spurring around the world about these subjects on social science and AI in our future in these spaces. Check out the links in the bio below to the sift.net profile page for Sonia. Also hi-seas.org. Also her LinkedIn and Twitter profiles. Go check those out. And support the artists, the entrepreneurs, the leaders in your communities that you believe in. Support them and help them grow. You can find our links below to our show simulation. You can find us on PayPal, cryptocurrency, Patreon. Support us. And go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. We love you very much. Thank you for tuning in, and we will see you soon. Peace.